Holly Carter is one of the executive producers. Woo! And, uh, and then also we've got five of the actresses playing the five Clark sisters here today. Uh, and uh, starting with Christina Bell, who's playing the twins. <laughs> Kira Sher, who's playing Karen. <laughs> Shalea Frazier, who's playing Dorinda. <laughs> Raven Goodwin. Who's playing Denise? <laughs> and Angela Burchett, who's playing Jackie. <laughs> and just a quick reminder Christine Swanson directed based on a script written by Sylvia Jones and Camille Tucker. And they, all of the executive producers include Queen, Queen, Queen Latifah, Mary J. Blige, Missy Elliott, Loretha Jones. Holly Carter, who's here with us today, and Shakim Compare. So, uh, we're going to start with some photographs. Ron will start with a few questions to get us uh, warmed up. Let's talk about your audition process and, uh, and your role. Uh, the audition process was so easy. I'm kidding. Uh, no, but uh, it was such a, a, a wonderful experience. First of all, I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to audition. Um, and for Twinkie Bird to actually say yes, you are Twinkie, uh, it, the Clark sister. And um, you know, it was such an amazing uh, experience. I screamed as soon as I found out. And uh, that's the reason why I don't have a voice today. Kidding, kidding. <laughs> but um, you know, it, I, I can relate so much to uh, Twinkie and all that she's gone through actually. I was in a group and um, I was the lead of a group and um, it was so much stuff that just fell down on me um, to make sure that I did what I was supposed to do as that leader. Um, also, I'm divorced, uh, single parent, so I understood um, a lot of where she um, came from, and um, I understood the pressure of life and what people do as far as judge um, when things don't work out all the time. So uh, when you see this movie, you'll you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But it was so incredible the story that she. Um, uh, and that she's overcome so many obstacles um, in her life. And Kira, the same question for you? Uh, the audition process for me, I was super nervous. Um, I often wanted to go to the bathroom. No. Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> but it was really special. Um, I don't know, at, at first I wanted to play Auntie Misi's role, um, but then they were like, no, it's, it's perfect for your mom. And um, it was just really special. So also seeing that as long as I've been in the house with my mom, I obviously didn't know her as well as I thought. So I'm like, okay, well you're just a G. So it was really special. And um, the audition role, uh, just having to sing like her, I've been saying that often, having to sing like her, I kept getting lightheaded because I can't say that I'm a true soprano as she is. Um, so having to, <laughs> I kind of, <laughs> So that the audition, all of that, it was it was um it was cool and, and it, it challenged me, which I was really honored to even have that challenge. Uh, but that that's it for me. Oh man, I um I never really done acting on the scale before, so getting an acting coach was the first thing I did. <laughs> and Josie Harris was amazing, and she really helped me find just my inner Dorinda. And, um, and, and really just by staying true, I, I look at the story and there's so many similarities. I come from a family of four sisters, um, blended family as well, and so some of the issues that you'll see in the story of, of having a different mother, a different father, I've lived that. Um, and um, just having a, a deep love for my mother, Dorinda loved her mother so, so they all did, but, you know, she was called Dr. Maddie Moss Clark Jr. You know, there was a special bond, I think, that, that she felt and just this fierce, fierce love. And I have that same thing for my mom. So I really took just, you know, my experiences and, and just seeing how it mirrored so, so, so many of Dorinda's experiences and um, just kind of merged them together. And so auditioning, I just was true to myself and, and finding that Dorinda voice, um, not only just in her spirit, but just sonically. Um, she has this amazing tone that is, you know, 
almost equal parts of rasp and clarity, which is so hard to do. And she just does it so effortlessly. Um, and I just, my natural singing voice is just a little bit more on the clear side. And so I had to just find that space and, and Donald Lawrence was really, really helpful in getting that sound. And so um, auditioning, I just wanted to make sure I nailed it in just her mannerisms um, and just her presentation. I remember when I went to Detroit, didn't even have the role yet. And um, I met with Kiki, and, and I will never forget her um, her little nephew. He came to the door and he said, you remind me of my Auntie Dodo. <laughs> and you know, kids are just so pure and so innocent, and so that's when I thought, maybe I have a chance. <laughs> maybe I have a chance. And if her, you know, if her, this will be her great nephew. Yes. You know, if her great nephew saw me and immediately said that, I thought maybe, maybe there was a chance, and so, um, her mom prayed for me. Karen Clark uh, said she cheered, said she was going to pray for me to get the role. I had my mom praying for me, and so by God's grace, I'm here playing Dorinda. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, this audition process for me was was different. I had just moved. I had just relocated to Atlanta. I was so used to going in the room, and you know, I've known Twinkie Bird for a very long time, and. You know, it's, it's just a different dynamic when you're able to stand that you have a certain amount of pressure on you when you uh, go into these rooms. Uh, but I was <laughs> in Atlanta, I just got, uh, I had my camera, but I didn't have all of my equipment set up yet. So we're like in my hallway upstairs trying to, my fiance and I are trying to maneuver, we're arguing. It's just like a, a circus. And, um, but, but we got it done and I, I, I auditioned for Twinkie and Denise. And uh, I knew Twinkie, um, it, it didn't really feel right because um, I'm not as musically inclined as, as these amazing women. So I, and I knew Twinkie had to be strong, um, but Denise stuck with me uh, for some reason and um, I'm always playing Anisi. So, <laughs> That's crazy. I'm always That's playing Anisi who goes against the grain, who has her own mindset so um, I just it, it just stuck with me um, and you know having the opportunity to tell this story with these women um, I, I, I couldn't really fathom I was like oh, that is too good to be true like it's is but my mom she she has these weird moments and she spent it was around Christmas and she spent around three times and she said you're gonna do that movie you're gonna do the clock sisters and I was like girl Girl, <laughs> okay. And and I, I got a call from Louisa Jones a week later and she said, she she said, I want you, because she knows I want to direct and I want to branch off into, um, you know, different realms of filmmaking. And she said, I, I, I want you to come on set in, in Shadow. And I was like, okay, like I'll come to Toronto to Shadow. She was like, no, I'm kidding. We want you as Denise Clark Bradford. And I just, I just, you know, had a moment and I was in such a, like I said, I was moving, I was in such a transformational phase in my life that this movie was exactly what I needed for my spirit. And um, mm. and that's the thing about their music is that it, 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 it renews your faith, it reminds you of your spirituality, I'm getting emotional, and it reminds you of, of, of who you are and um, why you're here. And that's what this movie did for me. So it was, it was, it was deeper than me booking a role and me being on TV again. It was about um, me as a person and my spirit growing and I needed it and God knew I needed it and he met me halfway. Wow. Hey everybody, uh, I play Jackie Clark Chisholm, the eldest Clark sister. Um, for me, um, I was at the end of tour. I was touring Color, the Color Purple at the time. And I'm gonna use that because this is yes. a little, little boomy. <laughs> Uh, and I heard about the project and I immediately felt like there was somehow I was going to be a part of this. Uh, I'm from Detroit. I'm the eldest of three sisters we all sing. And I know so much about the Clark sisters because they were so instrumental in how my sisters and I sang together, how I sing, how you supposed to look when you're up there, how you're supposed to dress, always being fabulous and so you know as time went on and I 
finally got a chance to go on tape for it, uh, I was beyond, but I was very nervous because I wanted it so bad and I felt so like connected to it. Uh, but I originally went on tape for Twinkie and then later on went on tape again for Denise and Jackie. So, of course, as an actor, you're thinking, how can I differentiate these three ladies to both show the difference and to, I don't know, somehow uh, make it clear to them which one I would be if they decided to, to cast me. And ultimately, um, as I worked on Jackie's material, a warmth just kind of came over me because I said, this, this is you, of the three, this is you. You know this, you know what it means to be strong and be a rock for people when maybe your sisters can't. You know what it is to step up and speak up and use your voice when things need to be said. It might not be as nice or, you know, as sugary, but it needs to be said. And ultimately, you know, when I got the role, I was beyond, I was floored because I, I was so excited. And as I prepared, I got to talk to Jackie and realized that we had so much in common and to hear her speak so vulnerably and raw and transparent about her life and her life as a Clark sister and as herself, it quickly became clear to me that my mission, the biggest one for me, was I wanted to give Jackie voice. I wanted her to feel like she was not just a face amongst five other people, that she had a place, that being the anchor is just as important as being out front. Sometimes the, the front can't hold up if the back isn't strong. And so, um, you know, I, I was honored to be able to do that and it stretched me as an actor because I come from the theater world. And you know, theater is very big and very presentational and very showy. And you have to bring the world of a big hall or theater into a lens. And it was really cool to watch, like Ray, for example, who's a vet, she's been doing this since she was a young girl, to watch her work and watch our director guide us through these things. And you know, about day three or four shooting, I'm, I'm like, hmm, I'm a pro, hey. the TV, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, and uh, it was so nice to see the ladies evolve and our camaraderie and to see it on, on screen. Uh, so, so I felt a divine connection to this project and I'm, I'm so glad that I got to be able to do it and, and be a part of this with these beautiful, talented, amazing ladies. Why did you decide to get involved in this project and why is the story so important? Uh, I feel like the story is important because it's the story of us, of women, of uh, faith, of um, redemption and inspiration. 17 years ago when uh, the Lord gave me the idea to get on a plane and go to Memphis, to meet with the Clark sisters and Bishop Shear to see if I can have this story. Um, it was at that point that I knew I was on a mission to try to bring a story to life and it literally took about 17 years. And um, I didn't know why it was taking so long until I realized why Kiera had to grow up so she could play her mother. Um, but I, it also connected the idea that, you know, time, season, and purpose uh, makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a time for this movie, and now is the time, especially in, a, in an era when the voice of the woman is being released, and we are more powerful, and we have more opportunity to um, impact the earth and culture with those things that matter. Uh, Maddie Moss Clark was a woman of faith, a strong woman, a gifted woman, and she saw talent in her children. And so her job was to push it out of them. And in order to do that, she was a little firm. You know, um, The other thing that I admired about her, she's the first woman who started three-part harmony in choirs. And so she was a woman of firsts. And many of us women today have become and are becoming women of first. So 17 years later, it took a while, but Jesus came through. <laughs> I didn't know it was gonna happen, but it did. Right, right. And so I stayed with it because of <coughs> it. Um, did you learn anything about your mother that surprised you? Um, I 
did, I, I actually can say that I learned more about the, the sisters overall than I did about my mom because I am so close with her. Uh, but I did learn that she did speak up at my grandmother's funeral more than she had done before. Um, and I think that was when I learned, oh, it's a ghetto side to you. So, um, because I'm so used to her being so graceful and so poised and composed. And um, I've heard stories, but when I had to like be there and play it out, it's like, oh, she, she does respond. And because she is the youngest, very often people will, you know how when you're the youngest and you're usually quiet until something happens. Um, then she responds. So I'm like, okay, so I understand. So that was one thing that I, outside of her, you know, being the mother to me where she would hit us and we saw the heat of her. But seeing that as a young sister, it was like, okay, this is really cool. But the story of Auntie Twinkie and all of that is what really inspired me. Um, and, and seeing what my grandmother had gone through as far as being in a leading role in the church um, and then even kind of being crucified for going to the Grammys went to us is so much that is now accepted in gospel music when she was breaking, literally breaking barriers and she didn't even know for a day of when she would not be alive. Um, so those are the things that uh, stuck out to me and, and outside of my mom, uh, but the sisters and my grandmother. We're gonna open it up. Just remember to state your name and your media. Hi, I'm Cora Jackson Foster and I'm with the Los Angeles Sentinel newspaper in uh, LA. My question is for you, Dr. Carter. You've got three other powerhouse women joining you, a powerhouse woman, as a, an executive producer. These women are to, more known to be associated with secular music. How did you get them to join you on this gospel <coughs> process, project? Well, um, I go back to timing and season. They were at a time, you know, in their life when they wanted to talk about how gospel music has impacted uh, them on their journey. And each of them have very similar stories when it comes to how the Clark Sisters music got them through dark times, how their music encouraged them and, and inspired them to be better artists. And so each of them have their own testimony that is pretty profound when it comes to the legacy, the life, and the music of the Clark sisters. Um, Shaquem Compare, one of the uh, one of our executive producers, is the one who's responsible for bringing them to the table. He came to me and said, listen, Latifah loves his music, loves his family, we wanna be involved, and we're gonna build it out and bring other people, and that's exactly what he did. But I think what was unique about it is that he brought people to the table that the music had already affected, and that made their passion and their <coughs> involvement in the process um, more uh, you know, intentional. But with everybody being a type A personality, who's in charge? You know, what I loved about it is everybody had input. And what Shaquem was very key and Dana were very clear to do is say, listen, this is your lane. So you drive the car, we will put the gas in it. And that is what we did together. Thank you. This is also the entertainment. Um, I wanted to, uh, one of my questions was to Dr. Clark as to why uh, do the Clark sisters at this particular age? <coughs> you answered that by saying it was up to God, really, basically. Yes. I I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. I was going to ask you why did the documentary or the story be about the Clark sisters at this particular age? But I guess your reply earlier was it was really up to God. Yeah, it was up to God and timing. <coughs> and the seasons who, who, whose time has come is the most powerful. And that's, that's why we're here now, because 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been ready. The, you know, it wouldn't have been ready. Yeah, that was my follow-up question. Sometimes you don't understand what God is doing <coughs> right. But then when you look back, you say, oh, that's right. why. I'm just wondering. Uh, have you realized yet why we did now? Oh, yeah. 
Kiara had to get, be born. She had to be raised. She had to learn how to sing. Well, she didn't have to learn how to sing. It was already in her belly. But she had to come into her gift. She had to stir up her gift. Once it was stirred up and cultivated, then it was time for her to come on into the scene. And I think, I think, you know, not only that, these women had to walk their journey because it's something special about being able to take on the life of someone else and make it feel authentic. And they had to go through their stories, their share of experiences that she just spoke of, how she could relate to, to Twinkie. And there's nothing better than authenticity. And these women authentically laid out every character that they were cast in, and I'm super proud of each of them. Hi, uh, Zon Damore, directed by Damore. Uh, my question is for Raven and for Christina. Um, so I watched the film last night, amazing, beautiful job. Um, so I noticed that, um, I think that was really, but a big aspect of the film was that um, when you signed, when your character signed over the contract, that was a, a very big deal about, you know, um, just giving away the car or, or taking the car in exchange for the music. But then we see when um, Nisi's character gets pregnant, that follows, you know, that scene. It, is, it seems to be a much bigger deal. You know, so can you both speak to um, just, and then when, when the mother passes, um, Maddie Moss, you still don't reconnect with the sisters. So can you kind of speak to um, the disconnect within the, the church of being pregnant out of wedlock um, and how that decision impacted the sisters versus with today, you know, it's a big deal of, of giving away the music. And as a viewer, I, I thought that was a bigger deal, um, the contractual side than the Right, pain. right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I think Dr. Maddie Moss Clark, she was big on them living what they sang about. And so um, being pregnant out of wedlock willy nilly wasn't really aligned <laughs> aligned with um, <laughs> aligned with the, um, the culture of the Kojic church and um, but no matter what she was like we, we, we got to keep going we got to move forward um, because there's a bigger uh, message that we have to get across um, so they got through it and, you know, Nisi ended up having more children and, and, you know, doing what she wanted to do with her family life. Um, yeah, I just think that it, it just wasn't aligned with what, you know, Dr. Maddie Moss Clark, she, she was in the future already. She had a vision and it wasn't aligned with her vision. And I think that, um, first of all, I think it's important, and, it's, and please excuse my voice, I've been coughing all day, like Angela. <laughs> but um, I think that it's important, first of all, that artists understand that it is not okay to just give over what you worked so hard for. Back in the day, when something was presented to a lot of um, artists, um, and female artists that didn't really understand the industry, they did what they thought was best at the drop of a dime. And when you flash money into in front of some people's faces, they want to make decisions on their own. So they feel like, okay, this is the best decision for me at this time. Um, even still to today, I know that a lot of artists just give away what they work so hard for. And, um, a lot of us are artists here, and we're women. We have to understand that it is important to own your own stuff. I'm understanding that now. And so um, Dr. Maddie Moss Clark wanted for her, her children to understand that you don't just hand over what you've worked so hard for. And it's important once you once uh, people start seeing the film that they understand that that was very vital. It was very important. And no, it wasn't um, her mom's music, but her their mom wanted them to understand that it was so important for the generations after them that they own everything that they had. If you sit in a room by yourself all day long and you write something, 
that should stay under your belt, not anybody else's. Nobody else should own what you've worked so hard for. And so I think that today, now they understand, I believe that today, now they all understand, it's important to own your own stuff because they come out with music under Karoo Records, <laughs> that's theirs, you know? So now they understand it, now they get it. And not just one person, but everybody now understands it. Hey ladies, Hello. LaCora Stevens with The Yes Show, young, entertaining, and saved. Right. Uh, my question, a lot of the fans uh, of the Clark sisters, the, the, <coughs> the people, the cast, the executive producers, they want to know, is there going to be a soundtrack? Like, will the voices that we hear from you ladies be featured on a solo album or anything like that? There will be a little sneak of something peak, but I'll let you know. <laughs> a sneak of something peak. A sneak of a peak. <laughs> oh, you didn't know it? <laughs> Firstly, just thank you for opening up. I think when I watched it, I really left, it pricked my heart. Because I think um, no matter what family that we have, we all have relations. We don't know the dynamic, but there's always some sort of relational thing going on, and I think just opening it up will open up conversations for home. Um, so thank you for that. I also loved how you we learned things about your grandmother without you saying it. Like she was financially literate, right? For her to be able to give money back that she's been collecting it says a lot about her business side and the financial side. Um, and when you don't see that a lot in the black community in church, I thought that was really good. My question is, um, when I saw your mom, I saw your mother Karen right before the new year, a little girl was like, that's Kira's year tomorrow. <laughs> so I wanted to bring a question for that age range and really started to understand the culture because like she was like, I thought the contractual thing was a lot worse than the pregnancy. But I think it's important that when we see that 1963 cross across the screen and 1963 that there's something culturally that we can kind of throw out some culture, church culture just for the teens that don't understand like what? Like why she made her go back and change it just a, a skirt? Like I don't get it. So can we just talk about the culture? Like you know what are some normal, normal things in that culture, things that we could do and could not do so that when they're watching they can like get a better understanding? Pants. The pants. You cannot wear pants. You cannot wear pants, you cannot wear red. Um, Fingernail polish, you could not wear lipstick. It was strong. It was a very strong uh, time. You couldn't even, in my instance, work in Hollywood. You know, so going to the Grammys was a sin. So that's why the church, the national church, wanted to sit her down if she did it again, because that was interfacing with the world. So they did not believe it. It was, you know, staunch and it was you know, very uh, rigid in its beliefs. Uh, and we have such, I'm, I'm Kojic, so I'm out of Kojic. We have such now, you know, progressed and things have changed clearly because I have on a short skirt with stockings, with this would have been a seal right here because they have designs on them. But thank God we've moved out of that era. Um, but that's, you know, uh, Kiara can speak to it too because she's a Kojic baby, born and raised, you know. You can't be born in it. No, you can't join it. You gotta be born in it. That's what the, that's what the slogan said. Um, I think the understanding the generations before and understanding that it wasn't always, it wasn't black and white because they just wanted it to be. I think it was a level of accountability that was often misunderstood. And I think that that level of accountability is necessary for our generation because some of us can't even take the heat of correction. It's just, I just want to live my life and do whatever I need to do. And sometimes, um, I mean, even not to be churchy, but the Bible says that in the multitude of counsel, there's safety. And I've seen a lot of my friends just make a lot of error uh, or poor decisions just because they didn't have the village that they thought was only for the child, but it was for the adults as well. And in this film, you see Dr. Clark still correcting their daughters in their 20s, where now in this age, while we're in our 20s, you can't tell me nothing. I'm out and you can't tell me I'm grown, all of that. But even though in the word it says to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to take the disposition of a child. And unfortunately, so many of us are so confused and just like, don't judge me, don't tell me anything, when 
I understand not wanting to be judged, but sometimes you need someone to tell you that there's a better part of yourself yes. so that you can reach your highest potential. And so you see that with Dr. Clark constantly putting out correction, because also the word says that a fool despises correction. If can't nobody tell you that your breath is hot and it actually stinks, right. then you're not going to have the solution to your problem. Um, so I in this film, in this film, and, and, and still being committed to my church, my father is still looking for myself and the Clark sisters. Where were y'all on Sunday? Y'all missing too many Sundays. And we give a response. We give an answer because you have people who are looking at your leadership skills. And I think that it also trains and develops as well as cultivate incredible leaders because you have so many who say, I have a dream, but they're not committed to anything. And I think that being in the Kojic Church, while I have some things that I disagree with, um, having to have that level of commitment has made me who I am today. And I would say, um, looking at the Clark sisters and the standard that they've made sure or maintained, um, it, it speaks to why they have longevity. It speaks to why they have legacy. But because you know we're in this culture where social media is like, go with it right now, just take it and just post any and everything with no kind of discretion. But even the word says to have discretion, that is a beautiful thing. So it's not so much of me being a hypocrite or me trying to hide anything. It's just, are you using any form of discretion to protect what your child may view of you or the decisions that they may make just because they heard about what you did? Yeah. So I think that what Dr. Clark and what the sisters are upholding in the film is a powerful statement. And it speaks to not just those that are of faith, but it speaks to those who are planning to have a bright future. You don't want to be held hostage of your past um, in your future. So I think that's what the story, it, it is minister or said to me, not to be tragic, but it said that to me for sure. <laughs> Okay, we have time for one more, and I know you guys want to get your one-on-one -on -one individual interview. So when we do that, it's about six minutes with the uh, respective groups, and just you know, we've got a lot of energy, so just try to keep to the six minutes. Everybody can talk to the ladies, and we'll do one more question, and then we'll break it down. Break it down. Just give us a couple seconds to set up the little section, and then you all will be on your way. Okay. Hey, sorry. I'm, my name is Sean. I'm with a &E, but um, on behalf of our Southeast Asian office, so they, they actually bought the movie, so they're going to be airing the film throughout Southeast Asia. And they want to know, there's a lot of growing women's movements in Southeast Asia right now, kind of similar to how we were looking back in the 60s, and I'm, I want to know what you think those audiences can learn from watching the Clark Sisters. Wow, well, I think they're going to, first of all, learn about a whole different culture of not just black culture, but black church culture. I'm sure it's not, you know, super, super prevalent in the way that it's presented in the film. Uh, but I think particularly the scene where Dr. Clark stands up for herself, I think that's gonna be very impactful to every audience that watches it because she really went out on, on a limb there. She, she, she took a huge risk and she almost did it, but something in her, that drive, that strength, that was in her, that's in her daughters, made her turn around and say, right is right, and I'm gonna stand up for it even in the face of adversity. So I'm hoping that that scene and other scenes where tons of moments in the movie where you see a lot of strength in women standing up and taking risks, I think that's gonna be a big uh, a teacher for, for that culture. Um, outside of, they'll be experiencing you know, a really cool, you know, genre of music and, and the passion. Gospel music is so passionate and so fiery and you're gonna get a lot of those moments with the ladies here. So I'm thinking that's what they'll get. Okay.